All right, hey folks. We are right, hey going folks. to get on after this. Uh, let me turn down my volume here. It sounds like I'm coming after. through okay. Uh, normally, I'd work on Spelljammer on a Thursday evening, but I have a play test coming up for the Marshall Power System, and we have been updating the mechanics for the channeling mana system, so I need to go through and make sure all the classes and subclasses are updated uh, with the get rid of that weirdness in the background there. What's up with that? I'm gonna let a overly sensitive screen going on here. Let's see if I can tool that down a little bit. Overlay size, overlay position, uh, background blur. It doesn't look like I really can do much about that. Hopefully it stabilizes and stops being a problem. But all right, hey, so uh, my name's Phil Kearney. I create role-playing games, I illustrate them, I publish them online. I've been focusing my attention on Dungeons and Dragons here since the release of Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica back in 2017. A lot of us thought that maybe there'd be a little bit of uh, more magic, the gathering inside of D&D moving forward, but alas, earwax didn't happen. So I took it upon myself to build out the uh, Five color mana spell point variant rules that are on the DMs Guild now, where we um, replaced the eight schools of magic with the five color system from Magic the Gathering and removed spell slots and replaced it with a mana tapping, uh, a tapping mana system to um, uh, cast spells, trigger, and maintain effects. So we've been, uh, we already have, you know, you can check this stuff out. Let me rearrange my screen here real fast so y'all can see what it is I got going on here and then we'll get to work. So, uh, let's see. Uh, big shout out to the Ravnica DM um, community. I love going there and sharpening my knives on both uh, MTG D&D stuff as well as mechanic ideas. Uh, I am on the X Twitter platform as Phil Kearney, my, at Phil Kearney. You can follow me there if you want to get notifications when I'm live in the future. Otherwise, uh, big help to like, subscribe, hit the bell icon to get notifications of when I am live in the future. It's about 10 times per week, five days per week, Monday through Friday. Um, uh, uh, let's see, full playlist for the past 133 episodes is here in the full playlist. Uh, the Marshall Powers playtest content you can access through my Patreon here. You do not have to be a member of my Patreon to access the information, but uh, I, I sure do appreciate if you are. Uh, this is a read-only document. It's a Google Doc. This will eventually be turned into a, uh, a, a PDF document that will be placed on DMs Guild. Um, it covers all of the, uh, so just before I get too far ahead of myself, if we scroll down here, you can see the full five color mana spell point variant rule system that's currently on DMs Guild here. We have the revised color mana spell list, which converts all the spells into the five schools of magic. Uh, we have spell point warlocks, which has been out for a while. Elemental key, which is both a color mana as well as a four elemental system for monks. Uh, and we have the, uh, the core mechanics, knights and tricksters, uh, universal spell points, bunch of fun stuff here, all about 33% off. So the core mechanics book here takes all the spell casting classes from Dungeons and Dragons and converts it into the color mana system from Magic the Gathering. And uh, so um, it, it's spell casting, it covers all the casters. And if you check this out, the, uh, the revised uh, spell list, basically it breaks down the uh, various aspects of uh, mechanics in D&D into what five colors are as well as the types of damage that exist in 5e like the types of magic damage and aligns them to white blue black red green so we can then eyeball all the spells that are in the game and give it a look see to see like would this be like a warding effect so that's going to be white perhaps and then like augury is a divine is is divine inspiration or, or messages from your god so that that falls into the the white category fairly well bark skin being green uh, blindness and deafness is a, is a is sort of a, a, a black effect. Um, darkness definitely a black effect. So you can check all this stuff out. But this is only for spells and spell casting, right? So that means that there is a um, uh, a large set of classes that don't have any mana to be expressed through Magic: The Gathering color system, including the barbarians, monks, fighters, paladins, rangers, and rogues. So we built a mana system to be able to provide them with a color mana uh, as well. And a set of unique, you know, I'll open this up over here. About 200 different powers uh, inspired by 4th edition uh, pow uh, martial power stuff. 
uh, the third edition um, uh, Book of Nine Swords, which is also a type of Martial Powers book, and the Color Man Assistant that we built as well. So this creates a stack of, of common spell-like effects that the martial characters can use to have the same sort of quadratic progression that all the spellcasters have in a different bend, with a different flavor, more of an instant sustain and enchantment aura sort of effect instead of a sorcery, like where, where spellcasters are like sorcery and instant and enchantment effects. Martial characters are more instant enchantment aura and, uh, and like reaction effects. So you spend mana and have cantrip type effects that are more martial, like combat and exploration pillar where you're rolling dice and using your action economy to create, uh, to create power and you can combo different action economy together to create different effects. As opposed to like I just I, I plop down six mana to cast a six level spell and now you're disintegrated, like that's a very that that's a very wizardly sorcerer sort of thing to do, but like with this like uh, I could spend like it's a first rank power so I could spend one mana, choose a target that I can see within sixty feet. I'd spend a point of mana, and then that target gets knocked down and then you'd have to use an action. To make a strength saving throw against my channeling DC to stand up again. Otherwise, they, they're stuck prone. That dealt one power die of damage with one mana. But if I was a 17th level character, I could pump five mana into it. I point and click. You just take five D10 damage. And you just got knocked flat. Now you got to pick yourself back up. In the meantime, my rogue's going to get an uh, advantage to attack you. And he's just going to trade out some sneak attack dice to lay in all sorts of... Um, uh, mana uh, mana strike effects like uh, we can go down to the uh, stack of various sm uh, strike effects that we have um, such as um, yeah, we could go with um, um, <clears throat> freezing strike uh, your weapon can deal cold damage and add one power die per mana burned additional cold damage the creature's movement is halved until the end of a turn so even if they can stand up they barely have any movement left so you'd be able to kite them. Uh, there's goading strike. If you want to build an effective tank, you could pick up the goading strike. Or if you wanted to spend a little extra mana, you can lean into uh, provoking strike, which is uh, your weapon deals psych psychic damage and adds one power die per mana burned. The creature can only attack you until you lose line of sight or you are incapacitated. And the creature can attempt to end this effect by succeeding a wisdom saving throw at the end of each of its turns. And creatures that are immune to charm effects save with advantage. So you can force creatures into attacking you like a more, like a legitimate tank. And they all, all these abilities are either last one round or allow saving throws to get out of it. But a lot of them, it just, you get hit by it and it's affected, you're affected. So when you're using mana, uh, most of these effects are dealing extra damage and you're dropping some sort of condition or debilitation onto the opponent that you're facing. And that's just combat stuff. Uh, if you wanted to, you can get into the exploration and social um, um, uh, pillars of play with exploits. And like, for example, commanding presence, uh, which is when you're making an ability check that could use intimidate performance or persuasion skills, then you can roll one power die per mana that you burn, and you can add the highest result. Kind of like a bardic inspiration die, but you can like throw four of them and keep the best result. Granted, after two maybe three mana you're going to get an above average die result so there are depreciating returns with the more mana that you throw at something but if you really need to stick a landing you can dump a bunch of mana into it to make sure you stick a landing there's also a bunch of cool stuff like if i just wanted to have commanding presence always active whenever i make one of these die rolls i could learn this as a power and they'll get traipse down into the meta effects and i could pick up uh, and efficient power, which is when I when I use a power, I automatically generate one point of mana doing so. So it pays for itself, but I can only use that once, and I have to use I have to pick a specific power to use it with. So I could like learn commanding presence, and then I could learn command. Uh, then I could learn efficient power on top of it. And at first level, I only know two powers. So like if I always wanted to make sure I was rolling an extra D6 
on my persuasion, intimidation uh, checks, I could do that. So you can kind of build your own um, stat ability bonuses and there's a whole array of different abilities that you have. And then on top of that is all the class and subclass options. So right now I'm working on the monk and we've already built out all the classes and subclasses, but we did have some a play test recently which showed us there was some ways that we needed to change how we were wording stuff to make sure there wasn't any weird interactions. So as a result of that, I have to go through the entire document and update the language to make sure everything is still uh, relevant to the new tech. So we're going through that today. And the reason I'm doing that today instead of Spelljammer artwork tonight is because our first playtesting session is gonna be this Saturday. And I've got about maybe four or five hours worth of work to do here. So I really don't have any time for Spelljammer tonight. Um, I might be able to do Spelljammer at lunch tomorrow, but chances are I won't be doing Spelljammer again until Monday night. So I love you Spelljammer fans. We'll just keep jamming, but right now we got to throw some mana around. So let's get into it. Uh, let's see. First, just to keep you guys updated, let's kick on up here and look at what it is that the monk gets. What's the new tech for the monk using the martial power system? So we have, and a lot of this is already being gleaned uh, from the... Uh, Elemental key, which is specifically converting uh, the way of the four elements into a, uh, a red, green, and blue mana system, but could also instead be used with an elemental paradigm like Avatar the Airbender, where you have air, earth, fire, and water. There's a lot of parallels here. So if you wanted to be an air, if you wanted to be an earthbender, you would just devote all the powers that you have to earth. And we have here like elemental attunement is an earthen power, um, uh, sculpt the land, uh, which is mold earth. That's an earth power, um, um, earth trimmer, uh, shuddering stomp. That's an earth power, but it's also a red and green power because earth is red and, and green is a lot of nature stuff. So there's a lot of bleed over. If you're using a color magic paradigm, use, you would use either red, uh, blue, red, and green mana in any combination. And if we're doing earth bending, then you would decide, are you only allowed to bend one earth? Or are you allowing characters to blend and bend more than one type of element together? So you could have like a, like an, you could have like a, a, an air and fire uh, bender if you wanted to. That would like have access to uh, Fanes of the Fire Snake, uh, as well as like say, um, uh, Agnazar Scorcher, but also like, um, 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 what is it, uh, Earthbind, uh, which knocks creatures out of the sky, or like say, Gust of Wind, Hold Person. There's a lot of different powers that you could have access to using these specific elements. Now when we get up, when we go into the martial powers system, the martial power system says pick, like if you're using color, like I'm gonna be Boros, so I'm gonna pick white and red as my two color sources. When we're looking at powers, there's they, all the powers break down into five dis different disciplines. Uh, you're either using an exploit to modify die rolls and other action economy. Uh, there's maneuvers, which are like spell-like effects that can be channeled as an action or a bonus action or both in the same turn if you want. Uh, there's also reactions, which are basically like reactions or a slew of different opportunity type of uh, opportunity attack effects. Uh, there's also strikes, which are like smite powers. We looked at those recently. And then there's sustained powers, which are personal um, concentration, sustained aura effects. Kind of like in Magic the Gathering, when you put an enchantment aura onto a creature, you modify what that creature can do or be. These sustained powers do the same thing. Like, for example, Blind Sense. If I were to sustain one point of mana, I'm aware of location of any creature and objects on the same plane of existence as me. Within 10, uh, within 10 feet times my max rank of power. So like at ninth level, I'd have access to third rank. So my, if I trigger, if I tap one mana, I'd be able to sense creatures with blind sense up to 30 feet away. And then I could stack on top of that, since I'm ninth level, I could have up to third rank of power. I can have up to three mana worth of sustained effects active at the same time. So I could have blind sense active, and then I could on top of that say, What's a, what's a cool, tasty second rank power that we could add in on top of that? Um, auto attunement, uh, while sustaining this power, I'm attuned to any magic item that I'm holding or wearing 
as long as I meet the prerequisites. So I, as an artificer or any other character, I could have a whole bag of tricks or like a bandolier full of wands and other things that can just trigger this power and maintain it, pull out an item, I'm automatically attuned to it, and then I can use it. But it's costing me basically a second level spell worth effect to maintain concentration on this thing. So I can build my own type of action economy in how my character operates inside of the game by different exploits, reactions, strikes, uh, maneuvers, and sustained effects that I build for my character on top of all the cool stuff that I get from my subclass and my class features. So if I were to be, say, a Boro, let's go with Izzet, that's fun. If I were to be an Izzet character, which is blue and red, those are the artificers on Ravnica. I would naturally want to pick up auto attunement. That's a supernatural thing that an Izzet, um, an Izzet character would want to have. So I would then be able to, like, say, I've got blue and red mana. So there's five disciplines. Uh, one of those five disciplines, exploits, maneuvers, reactions, strikes, and sustained powers, one of them can be channeled using either blue or red mana. So let's say sustained powers are going to be universal. So I only have two types of mana, blue and red. Whenever I finish a long or short rest, any mana that I have, I can reconfigure to be like all red, all blue, or any mix of red and blue in between. I would then like say have like say ninth level. I'd have um, like say an Z, uh, an Z Ranger would have 18 mana. So I could have like nine points in red and nine points in blue. And when I sustain auto attunement, I could take one point of red, one point of blue, tap those, and now I can sustain auto attunement for however long I can maintain concentration on. And, uh, and then I would then, I have four disciplines left. Exploits, maneuvers, reactions, and strikes. Those two, those four uh, exploits are, or those four disciplines are divided into two groups, one being blue and one being red. Like say, and you can change this whenever you gain a level. So like, let's say I want reactions and strikes to be red because red generally is like impulse, um, uh, spontaneity, swift movements, um, snappy instant effects, right? So the snappy instant stuff I'm gonna narrate as being red magic. So reactions and strikes become red. That means that my exploits and my maneuvers become blue. If I'm playing a character, I don't have to have any exploits or maneuvers if I don't want to. So then I can just dump all 18 of my mana into just red and have sustained effects, strikes, and reactions, and basically be a skirmisher striker, kind of like what rangers are kind of set up to be anyway. And then on top of that, I can pick any of the number of subclasses out of the ranger kit, which we will get to later on today, and you can see what that cool shit can do for you. So but right now we're playing, we're working with a monk. So let's, uh, so now that you have a general gist of how this stuff works, Let's dive into the monk, you know, your channeling feature, you gain, oh yeah, just uh, take a look at the master list. Everybody is working off of half casting using this. Um, and if you're wondering, the ranger, the paladin, they're hybrid characters, so they can learn spells or powers. They're going to use the color mana system regardless. That is that ranger could have any number of blue and red spells off of the ranger's spell list, plus any stack of uh, martial powers and can prepare and swap those out every time you finish a long rest. Just have a, a just, you have a, a ranger typically has access to like around 60 some odd spells, depending on what they have access to. Uh, this would give them an extra 150 some odd options to stack on top of that. So now you have the same quadratic spread of options that say a sorcerer would have with half casting progression and half casting firepower. Plus the ability to make things, uh, reduce them to being cantrips as early as level one. So you literally never have to spend any mana if you don't want to. And the real kicker here is if you're like, I don't want to have to pull a bunch of levers and dials to play a character, but some of this stuff seems cool. You can use any power. You can, instead of learning a power that uses mana, here's all the feats that you can learn instead. First level ranger has two powers that they learn. So you could learn, say at first level, you could take, mm, I don't know, poisoner and um, sharpshooter for instance. So now you can poison your, your arrows and point, take a shot. There you go. At first level, and say you have a, 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 a background, well, you're probably going to take the Azette background to get a stack of free spells, right? Well, if you're using powers instead of getting spells, you could choose all of the powers that you get 
for taking that background. So here is the conversion. Like, let's look at Azet. Uh, is that we are still giving you cantrips, shocking grasp, and produce flames. Those don't require any mana. It's just things you have access to. But you would also have like adept crafting, keen mind. Uh, keen mind's a feat, so you get a feat, an extra feat on top of it from is that at first uh, at your first rank when you're getting second rank power at say fifth level because you're a ranger. You'd gain uh, inspired skill, which is a sustained effect that you tap it, choose a skill you're not proficient with it or a weapon. Shocking Strike deals lightning damage and takes away reactions. Swift Attunement, we were looking at Swift Attunement earlier. Trap Springer allows you to uh, detect and understand traps that are within range of you. Uh, telekinetic Bubble is, uh, is literally like Tensor's floating, is like uh, um, uh, Odalix Resilient Sphere. You can put it on yourself or an enemy. Uh, Opt allows you to re-roll dice. Uh, auto attunement. We uh, swift attunement is when I grab an item, I automatically become attuned to it. It costs me mana to do that. But auto attunement, and this is swift attunement is per item that I grab. So like if I have like three or four items, and it, it ignores your attunement limit. So as long as I'm holding an item, I'm attuned to that item. Auto attunement is any number of items that I am holding, I can become attuned to, but I have to be holding them and wearing them. So you can really stack out your magic gear, but it costs you mana to do it. And then Empowered Synergy, uh, that allows you to, uh, what were we using Empowered Synergy for? Uh, and, oh yeah, Empowered Synergy, uh, that allows me, like whenever I use a bonus action, uh, I, can, uh, I can make an attack as part of that bonus action. Like anything that I do, like if I sustain a power as a bonus effect, or if I channel a maneuver, as a, as a bonus action, I can make an attack with it as well, any kind of attack that I have ready. So you gain this stack of stuff, but like a ranger could choose between powers and spells that your subclass would give you. Or I mean, uh, as a Zet, you'd have a, you have a, a stack of is that spells that you could have. So you could choose any stack of is that spells or these powers, a ranger could mix and match them because a ranger is both a spellcaster as well as a channeler and that's what we call a hybrid caster or a hybrid character because they can do both so your hybrid character here's a hybrid progression that the amount of mana that you have on a long rest here's the size of the power die that you have that you roll when you're doing strikes and exploits and it gains in size up to a d10 eventually not quite as good as say a battle master or um, a, a bard these classes can do a ton of stuff that other classes can do, just not quite as well. So you're opting into your own kind of build, but it's not as efficient as a character that's specifically built to do the thing that you're duplicating. Like you could gain cunning action as a rogue. A fighter could gain cunning action, but it's going to require you to maintain concentration to do so. While a, while a rogue has it for free always. So cool little effects like that. Um, hey, what's going on, Ross? Crafting. You got new rules. Uh, new rules for crafting. What do you What do you mean by crafting specifically? Like crafting magic items? Because currently, all we're messing around with mana and spell-like effects as alternate spell sources. And let's see. We are working on the monk right now. I'm happy to engage with you, but I'm also doing uh, game design stuff here, so I'll be bouncing my attention back and forth to the tech that we're doing here and the conversation that we're having here on the sideboard. So be patient with me as we go through this stuff. Uh, let's see, just to look at stuff that the monk can do. Uh, the martial arts die that the monk can use. You can use, you can, a monk could either use the power die that they gain at the levels or you could use your martial arts die. And if 2024 comes true, the, mo the monk is eventually going to evolve into a D12. Um, if you're interested, like for example, in the uh, elemental key book that we have here, um, burp. We can scroll down here. There you go. Here's our table: D4, D6, D10, D12. Progressing at half casting progression. I think what we're going to see if uh, if you're using if you're using this power system, you'd use a D6 at first level, and that would stay with a D6 until nine, and then you'd be using a D8, and then you get a D10 at 13, and then you'd have your D12. So you're going to end up better off using this or the 2020, uh, 2024 Player's Handbook. Either way, uh, monks get a, a glam up in that sense. What's going on here? Uh, late night homebrew. Hey, goblins. Good to see you, my guy. Yeah, this isn't. Uh, this this doesn't provide any crafting. I have crafting rules. 
uh, they're just not in this document. So if there's a, if there's enough interest in that, you can drop into my Discord channel and ask me about that, and I can uh, I can share that document. It's not ready to go yet, but it exists. So let's see, monk class, glam ups, uh, unlock channel. Okay, here's a super fucking cool thing about about the uh, about the sustained powers. If you're say ninth level, you can uh, sustain up to three mana worth of effects, which is basically like haste, for example, is a third level spell. You could normally like maintain concentration on that using this color mana system that we have. Just the general color mana system that we have here on DMs Guild. It allows you to, whatever your max level is the number of levels of spells that you can maintain concentration together. But it increases the DC of concentrating on stuff. So like a, like a, like a fifth level wizard that could cast haste would be able to only maintain concentration on haste, but to be able to maintain it. The, the drawback is whenever you make a saving throw, you have to hit your concentration DC, otherwise it's disrupted even if you pass the saving throw or half damage, whichever is higher. So if a wizard is maintaining concentration on haste, you can maintain concentration all day, no time limit. But if you fuck up a saving throw, if your saving throw is below 13, you'll lose concentration. And since it's a mana system, you can cat like a like a fifth level like a fifth level sorcerer has 20 mana, like 27 mana because it's a sorcerer. So you'd be able to cast a third level uh, third level haste spell nine times during a day. The big the 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 big the 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 big um, criticism of spell points or mana in general is that you just have this fat pool that you can just spam low level stuff. The solution to that is to make is to make spells fragile. So if you set it up so that every time you make a saving throw, you could lose your mana. You're now chewing through people's mana. I could hit you with a ray of frost, a stupid little cantrip spell. But if my if my saving throw DC is high, you're gonna have to make a dexterity saving throw or have half your movement. I could just ding you with that just to hit you with a concentration check. So if I have an archmage that's dinging you with a ray of frost, you now have to make a dexterity saving throw DC 16, or I'm gonna dump like four, five, seven, nine, ten mana off of your character, and then you just got fucked on your entire stack of like your guard, like your spirit guardian cleric goes down. And he loses his spiritual hammer and his aura of vitality. Uh, like a 17th level um, cleric can maintain all three of those things at the same time. But he'd have to make a dexterity saving throw DC 19 to do it. There's no way. The Chances are, even if you have a paladin stacked with you, chances are you're going to miss that shit. So that means that your cleric just lost all his mana. And now he has to spend three rounds getting his shit back in gear again. And then I could just ding him with another ray of frost. So high risk, high reward. It's nasty, but it's really fun because now your characters have to really think about, God, if I tank up my cleric, what do I need to do to keep them from getting targeted by shit? And now your team is thinking high level chess in the third and fourth tier where everything is super fragile for them. So powerful cosmic, you know, like, like infinite cosmic power, but in a frail human body. It's super cool. But the martial power system is built for abuse. So the way that sustained powers work in the martial power system is if you want to, you don't have to maintain concentration. It's permanently on until you take a long rest. But if you do that, it reduces the amount of mana you can use. If you leave concentration in your channel, if you leave your channels open, I could sustain like, like a ninth level ranger could activate and have uh, a permanent haste as long as you can maintain concentration on it. Or... And, but I'd still be able to, like, you know, use third level spells like instant effects and stuff like you normally would. It's just my concentration is being eaten up by that haste spell. But a martial powers character can lock the mana. So I no longer have to maintain concentration on it. But a ninth level ranger that's sustaining three mana as a locked effect can no longer use any mana until I unlock and dump that power. So I'm having a trade off of my own action economy. I can, over the course of my character, dump on a bunch of buffs that I've permanized to become just part of my character's abilities. But I'm limiting how flexible I can use my mana. So, like, if I wanted to build, like, a super tanky character, I could build out uh, buff tank effects and then, like, maybe only have, like, two or three powers that require mana that I lock. And then I just pick a shitload of feats. So, like, I only need, like, two or three things. 
But then, now that I have the things that I want, the, the powers I want to maintain, I now have a list of 20 feats that I could choose. So my ninth level, like my ninth level fighter, for instance, um, I have 10 powers. And if all I want my ninth level fighter to have is permanized haste, then I'm going to have three mana. I lock haste on permanently. And that leaves me with nine powers open. I can now go shopping for feats. And I can save all of my ASI for stat bonuses. So it's a really cool, flexible system. If you don't want to mess around with all this monkey mana stuff, you don't have to. Just learn a bunch of feats. Crusher, Defensive Duelist, Dungeon Delver, Fighting it. Like, you can learn a bunch of Fighter Initiate powers, right? Uh, Great Master Weapon, uh, Polar Master, Sentinel. All the, like, those super hot hits, right? Like, if you just want to build out a stat character, go ahead. Or you can chuck Fireballs, you know? Take your pick. Build your own class. Build your own action economy. Make yourself as fragile, high risk, high reward as you want, or make yourself as stable and solid as a tank character as you want. So anyway, I'm geeking out a lot. What's up? Hey, Goblin. Hey, what's up, Bootleg? Good times, my guy. Uh, so I kind of like the idea that spells are fragile because they're woven together. Yeah, uh, they're not built like a wall with bricks. They're a web. Right. Good wording. Absolutely. And they're easy. Yeah, and they're easy to break. But but spellcasters have a fuck ton of mana. So they can afford to blow through theirs. When I was running uh, my uh, my 20th level, I ran an Eberron campaign for the past five years uh, from level one to 20. And uh, we had a Ranger, an Arcane Trickster, a Druid, and a Paladin. And the Druid, she could stack up, by 19th level, she could stack up 10 levels of stuff. And But she was constantly working with the Paladin and the Arcane Trickster and the Ranger to set up defensive areas so that she could safely stack on a bunch of mana to help protect the team while they would be taking hits, doing interceptions, blocking shots, making sure that, that her mana wasn't disrupted, which means that they needed to have a lot of coordination, making use of their action economy together, coordinating their actions, and planning. So they can't, they at like no point in that campaign where they just raffle stomping through stuff. Everything was a risk. Because again, at any time, I could just ping, I could just ding her with a ray of frost, and she just dumped all her mana, and now they're exposed. Anyway, so I geek out on this crap, so don't mind me. Uh, back on task. The goal here is to get through Monk and Ranger tonight. And then I'll be back tomorrow at lunch, uh, uh, Paladin and uh, Artificer and Warlock. So let's see, just to catch people up. Uh, so the, okay, so the reason I was talking about those lot channels is because the coolest thing, there's two super cool things here, like there's a billion cool things here, but one of the cool things is that a barbarian, while a barbarian, you can't maintain concentration while you rage, right? We all know that. Can't cast spells, channeling are not spells. Can't maintain concentration, so whenever you rage... Wait for it. Channeling Rage. While raging, you cannot maintain concentration. If you channel a sustained power while raging, it automatically locks. And locked powers don't reduce the max rank you can channel gained as a barbarian until your rage ends. And when your rage ends, your channels lock and you can't use mana anymore. While you're raging, even though these things are locked and permanent, your channel stays open. So even though I've stacked... So what do you do when you're raging? You stack on... Sustained effects, so your rage becomes a battery to sustain auras to make your tank, your 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 barbarian, like a frenzy berserker, adding on frenzy attacks, adding on haste, adding on swift movement. You can just stack on a shitload of of of, uh, of auras to make them more and more powerful, because you could still then like a like a seventeenth level barbarian could have could have haste and rogue stance and. Um, uh, and like uh, and like a wall runner could have all three of those things active as five mana locked, but I could also still use five mana to throw uh, to like to hit you with like a, a five d ten added strike damage, for instance. So uh, that's a super cool thing that barbarians do. Monks, on the other hand, because monks focus their whole thing, the whole you know story behind monks is that they're perfecting their their body, they're perfecting their connection with their inner self and their their prana or whatever, their key. And uh, and so as a result of that, uh, monks, getting down to it for the presentation, 
Uh, the monk's real power is unlock channels. When you lock a sustained power or monk class feature, your max channel limit gained as a monk is not reduced. So monks permanently have open channels. So the real power behind the monk, people dunk on the monk a lot, dunk on a monk, saying like their key doesn't go very far. But if you kit your monk into sustained powers, you get shitload of value out of it. And the cool, and we do cool stuff with it. Uh, like for example, Flurry of Attacks. Starting at second level, you can burn one mana to make two attacks as a bonus action using any combination of unarmed strikes, natural attacks, or light weapons that you are holding and proficient with. That's not new, but at fifth level, you can instead choose to tap and lock, tap or lock. Um, uh, sorry, that would be, you can, yeah, uh, you can instead choose to, I should actually change that. You can choose to, uh, yeah, that's the right word. Uh, you can choose to tap two mana to sustain flurry of attacks. It changes from sort of flurry of blows to flurry of attacks. When you do so, and as a bonus action on subsequent turns, you can use flurry of attacks at no additional mana cost while this effect is sustained. It automatically locks. It took two mana. At fifth level, I only have access to second rank powers, so this is going to eat up my entire concentration economy. But now flurry of blows is permanent on my character. So now you don't have to worry about spending mana each round to do flurry of attacks. You can just do it for fucking ever because that's what you decide. But now you can't you can't sustain anything else. So at some point you're probably gonna want to drop that and pick up something else. Like for example, I'll catch up with the text here in a second. Like art of mobility. So starting at second level, when you're not wearing armor or wielding a shield, you gain the following benefits. Your speed increases by ten feet, and the bonus progression continues based on you know what your character is. Here's your movement increase. I'll import this table into the document so that you play test it. So Goblin, you guys will have access to this stuff on on Saturday. Uh, and then also, as a bonus action, you can take the dash, do uh, the dash disengage and dodge act actions. Uh, I eliminated that as a, um, that, that no longer costs you any mana. It's just something you can do with your bonus action. And then when you take damage from falling, but your hit point total is not reduced to zero, you can choose to land on your feet, ignoring the prone condition. There you go. And then you get slow fall eventually. Uh, and then, starting at fifth level, you can tap, or, uh, you can tap one mana. Which will automatically be... You don't have to worry about locking it because it automatically locks and stays open. Uh, you can tap one mana during your turn to sustain the following effects. So you gain a climb speed equal to your walking speed and you can move up, down, and across vertical surfaces while leaving your hands free. And you can jump distances increases by a number of feet equal to your monk level. There you go. So you just tap that now. So a fifth level monk wouldn't be able to do Art of Mobility and Flurry of Attacks at the same time. But you can alternate between them as you need, as long as you're willing to spend a point of mana now and again to do so. Uh, and then uh, starting at ninth level, if you tap or uh, if you tap, see, I have to do some language updates. Tap two mana, you can walk across liquid. There you go. So we can go for a walk across the ocean, as long as you don't go to sleep, and uh, and it's tapped, so it's on forever, unless of course someone hits you with a dispel magic, then that could disrupt it, or you get knocked unconscious. That would also dispel it. Uh, but then when you wake up, you know, you just turn it back on and then you just grab the water and you just pick yourself back up and keep running fun stuff um as a dm if i wanted to i could take a bunch of kua toa or basically anything like pirates for instance and i could give them art i could give them this water runner ability and lock it on so people would be able to jump off of their boat and then come running after your ship <laughs> with glaives or whatever and then use wall climbing to just run across the water run up the side of your boat and start attacking your team so DMs can use this shit just as much as players can, and it's really fun when you do. I think I should catch up. Curious to see the Artificer. Huh, so Monk 5 level 7 fighter champion just fly. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, Goblin, you got to keep in mind, the playtest is only going to ninth level. So, <laughs> so we have a limit there. Um, uh, yeah, ninth, you know, we're going to ninth level. We're going to cap the, the playtest at ninth level. So because we're in a rubble belt, and it wouldn't be any fun if you could just fly across the roll belt and just avoid all the trouble. So I'm keeping the playtest at a low enough level that you're going to have to inter interact with the stuff that's in that's inside of the game. Um, but I, I spent a long time playtesting this at my home table from basically level 15 through 20. High level felt amazing. Fifth level on my playtest I ran last week felt amazing. I'm going to start this at third level just to make sure everything keeps parsing out properly. And over the course of the next four months, from level three to nine, 
I think we'll get a really good idea if the, it, what might be OP, if anything. I doubt it. Uh, but maybe we'll start adding in spellcasters in the mix just to, to see how those things sit with each other. Uh, focus strike, third level. Make an attack roll with an unarmed strike or a weapon that you're proficient. Unarmed strike, comma, natural weapon or a weapon that you're proficient with or, yeah, a weapon that you're proficient with, you can burn one or more mana up to your max channel limit to roll an equal number of power dice. Add the highest die result to your attack. You can do so before or after making the attack roll, but before any effect of the attack are applied. Instead of burning a mana for a plus two bonus, that's bullshit. This is actually gonna let you hit stuff. God, that felt so good. During the play test, I was using coordinated attack with, uh, with Dungeoneer packs um, uh, scourge. Uh, I would use uh, I, I would use my action economy to get a free use of coordinated attack. So he could use a, I would sacrifice an attack to get a free point of mana, so that I could use as a bonus action to use coordinated attack, so that he could use reaction to make an extra attack as his reaction. But when I do that, he gets to roll one of my power die and add it to his attack roll, and that allowed him to hit. A lot one power even just a d8 power die really goes a long way to be able to hit things consistently it feels like you're using your mana in a really smart way it's it just you don't feel like you're wasting your action economy at all it felt really really good um replenishing pool a lot of people have a problem with how little mana monks have third level alternate class feature when you roll initiative you regain a number of mana equal to the maximum rank gained as a monk so you get this at third level you only have first rank at third level so whenever you roll initiative, you get a point of mana. Have fun. Uh, empowered healing, fourth level power. Uh, starting at fourth level as an action, you can burn a number of mana up to your max channel limit. Fourth level, you still only have a mana limit of one. So you could spend one point of mana, but like at ninth level, you could spend three to roll an equal number of power dice. At ninth level, you're rolling D8s. Uh, so that would mean that you would then... Um, Roll a number of power dice. Let's see, uh, max channel limit up to equal to the number of power dice. You or a creature you touch regain a number of hit points equal to the total roll. Not as good as a cleric, but still pretty damn good. In addition, you or the creature touched can spend a number of... You could also... That creature could spend a number of hit dice up to the amount of power dice that I rolled to gain additional healing. So if I were to use two mana to heal the barbarian, he's going to get 2d8 worth of hit points from me and then he could burn two hit dice to get an extra 2d12 hit points back. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, also worth mentioning. Sorry, I'm all over the place today. Don't mind me. I'm overly caffeinated. But this is super cool because one of the things that uh, Primal Stamina, uh, when you finish a long rest, you regain all hit, uh, Barbarian hit dice uh, instead of half. And while not raging, as a bonus action, you can sacrifice any number of hit dice up to your max power rank. To, oh, oh, wait, that's that's not it. Um, bop, 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 bop. Bop, 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 uh, Right, so what you could do is a, a monk could ready an action and then um, touch to heal the barbarian. So when you touch the barbarian and heal, the barbarian is using his bonus action to burn hit dice. And you would then be able to heal him and then he could use his hit dice to not only get hit points back, but to get a number of mana back equal to the number of dice that, uh, that he's burning. So you can stack up your action economy that way by healing and regaining mana at the same time if you're dumping mana into your, monk, uh, into your, uh, into your barbarian. Just cool little action economy things that we can do here. Constructs and Undead, of course, can't be healed this way. Uh, let's see. What's up? Yeah, right on. Uh, are there things, uh, are there going to be any crazy effects like omnipotence? Matches the Gathering fan, loving you, Ross. Um, nope. Everything's basically everything is built. Everything is built to be calibrated by at fourth or lower level as spell casting. Uh, the um, I'll, let's see what is the what is the absolute craziest thing that we have here. Let's go look at our fourth rank shit. Um, uh, indestructible, um, four mana to sustain this effect, uh, which means you don't have access to it until thirteenth level. Uh, while sustaining this power, you re you gain resistance to all damage and attacks. Uh, you gain resistance to all damage, and attacks can't score critical hits. As a reaction to taking damage, you can dismiss this power and burn two additional mana. 
If you do, until the beginning of your next turn, you are now immune to that damage type. That's about as powerful as shit gets in this game. But that's actually really cool. You can jump into fire. Like, you can jump into lava and swim around in it for a little while. You're doing okay. Uh, Master of Fate, when you trigger this power, roll three d20 fate dice. When you later roll a d20 while the power is sustained, you can choose to replace the result of any one of these fate dice. Uh, when you later roll a d20 while this power is sustained, you can choose to replace that result, replace that result with any one of these fate dice. It's kind of like the divinity thing, right? Each fate die can be used only once. While this power is sustained, you can burn one point of mana as a bonus action during your turn to roll an additional fate die, replacing any result or regaining an expended fate die. Unused fate dice are lost when the power is dismissed. So a monk could activate Master of Fate and have a floating die pool of D20s that you could just swap out anytime that you want and then burn a point of mana anytime that you need to get another die into your fate pool. So that's that's like the high and crazy shit for like frenzied attack. While sustaining this power, you gain one additional attack as part of your attack action. So a fighter at 20th level fighter sustaining this has five attacks per round. And all attacks are at advantage. <laughs> that's that's pretty good. But that's about as crazy as sustained powers get right now. Uh, once this book publishes, we can do things like Book of Demir. And we can create a whole bunch of Demir effects specifically. Or like the Book of Blue for Omnipotence or something like that. Maybe we'll come up with something. Uh, let's look at high-level strike powers. Uh, there's only one right now. Four, uh, four mana, Banishing Strike. Uh, when your weapon deals force damage. You deal 4d10, or you deal 4, four uh, power dice worth of damage in addition, and the creature is banished and incapacitated for one month, returning to, uh, for one minute, sorry, returning to the same space it had been banished from, if unoccupied, otherwise returning to the next closest space uh, that can support its waste unless it was flying. The creature must make, a, the creature makes a wisdom saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect early if successful. There you go. And that's, that's the craziest strike power. But then paralysis, um, uh, your weapon, uh, it's three mana, your weapon deals psychic damage. Um, you'll do at least three power die worth of additional damage. In addition, the creature's paralyzed until the end of its turn, which means you can crit on it. So enjoy, totally worth it. Uh, explosive strike, um, you know, your weapon deals an additional, at least three extra dice of damage when you trigger this effect. And any creatures, uh, and all creatures within 10 feet of the creature that you hit, other than you, also takes those three dice worth of damage. There you go. So that's Explosive Strike. That's a pretty good one. Um, high level reactions. Um, hexproof, third rank, uh, three mana as a reaction to when a creature you can see targets you with a spell or magic effect. And in 2024, that probably means like whenever you're targeted by the magic effect or like, a, like whenever a magic action targets you, it's probably how it's going to end up being worded. Um, the creature must succeed a charisma saving throw at disadvantage or you are unaffected by and uh, you are unaffected and the spell or effect is wasted. So hexproof, there you go. It smells like magic. Uh, but the fourth rank power rider revival as a reaction to when you drop to zero hit points but don't die outright, you remain conscious and roll a number of power dice equal to the mana burned, which is going to be four. And at thirteenth level, it's eight, so forty-eight. Uh, you gain that many hit points instead. But that's a reaction. So these are reactions. So when I get dropped to zero hit points, if I throw four mana at it. I, uh, I stay alive and I gain four, uh, I gain 48 hit points instead. <laughs> so, but that's expensive. It's expensive to do that. But it also resolves that up, down, up, down, uh, that, that stupid motif of I got knocked down to zero. Someone has to walk over and heal me. I get back up. I keep fighting. This short circuits that. I just, fuck you. I just spend four mana and I just keep going. And I'm, and I'm stronger than I was a moment ago. So coming at you. Um, and then maneuvers, uh, fourth rank maneuver. Telekinetic bubble. Choose a creature up to large size you can see. It becomes trapped within the resilient sphere spell. Uh, the creature can make a dexterity saving throw at the end of each of its turns to end the effect. You can target yourself with this. And it's just a, it's just Odalix resilient sphere, which means you can't be targeted by effects because you have complete cover, but it's clear so you can see through it. And you can push it like a lot like a like a um, um, uh, like a uh, like a hamster ball. So if uh, there's that lava of lake again, I can just trigger telekinetic bubble around myself and then just roll across the, the lake of lava to the other side and then drop the effect and, and now I'm on the other side. So super fun stuff. 
But again, fourth rank isn't available until 13th level. Uh, and then exploits. What's high level exploits? Uh, exploits don't go very. Yeah, here we go. Uh, unstoppable as an effect. Uh, when an effect or condition other than incapacitated, unconscious, or death reduces your movement to zero, you can ignore the movement penalty until the end of your next turn. Though you might not actually be able to take any other action, you're literally unstoppable. And then uh, assassinating damage is the other. Uh, again, exploits trigger when you do something. They don't require any action economy, but they can be tied to something. Like like um, um, assassinating damage is when you deal damage with a weapon. Like if I were to, if I were to channel five damage, uh, five mana, to do a fifth level, like to do five dice with a smite damage, I could then spend an extra four damage to use assassinating strike. Uh, which is when you deal damage with a weapon attack to a target that has yet to act in combat or is unaware of your attack, you deal maximum damage, including any additional damage size such as sneak attack or when channeling the strike power. So you have to get the drop on somebody, and it'll cost you four mana to use it. It doesn't automatically crit, it just maximizes the damage. If you happen to crit, it'll double that too. And am I planning to have mana rocks? Oh, like uh, like uh, like uh, mana crit, like mana stones. Yes, artificers can create those. There you go. They can just make them uh, as 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 uh, as one of their infusions. They can just craft mana stones. That gives them extra mana. Yeah, and you can have up to five. Like a high level artificer can have five of them, which means you can spend your entire kit of magic items to get a, just a stack of like an extra twenty five mana. Sick. Yep. So that's that's your high that's your high scale stuff that we're looking at. Um, so let's see, stunning strike. Oh, yeah, here's modifications. Um, okay. So nice. Uh, let's see, um, action economy shit. Uh, empowered maneuvers begin at first level during combat. When you take the attack action, you can forgo any number of attacks to gain an equal number of temporary mana to channel a maneuver as a bonus action. So if I take the attack action at first level, I only have one attack. If I choose to forego that attack, I gain a free point of mana that I could then use as a because I can channel maneuvers as a bonus action. So let's look at maneuvers real quick so you see what kind of juicy shit we get. Telekinetic sphere is a maneuver, for example, but other cool stuff that we can do with maneuvers. Um, these are like sorcery instant sort of effects. Uh, bonus action, uh, bonus attack. Uh, make an attack with a weapon you're holding. You can draw a weapon as part of that attack. Make the attack with advantage. So a rogue, for instance, uh, would be like if, if a rogue is using empowered maneuvers, I can make the attack action. I could then forego my attack action and then use my bonus action to trigger bonus attack, which I could then make that attack anyway, but now it's at advantage, I automatically get sneak attack. I'm, I'm tweaking my action economy and using the system to build my own little synergies. Kind of like when you're building a Magic the Gathering deck, you want all the cards to synergize together so that they can build more results than what they could do alone. You can do that. You can like build a deck with your character's powers and action economy to be able to create cool things like that. So, like a a 13th level rogue, for instance, that gets the that gets the drop on an enemy that's using the assassination uh, assassinating damage, could sacrifice their attack, get a bonus attack to automatically get advantage. 13th level, you're gonna get what an extra 76 damage, and it's automatically gonna be maximized if I take the assassinating attack. And then I could then spend four points of mana on top of that to banish the target. So I hit them, I sneak attack them, I deal an extra 48 damage against them, it's all maximized, and I banish them and as a result of it, and they might not come, and, and they're gonna be gone for up to maybe a minute. So my team can get ready to set up for when they come back. So it's sick. Um, the, one of the main drives behind this game is that combat is supposed to last two or three rounds. A good way to guarantee that you're going to only have two or three rounds of combat is if your team does insane amounts of damage. So you can swipe through the amount of stuff that you're fighting. They'll feel like gods in it as a result of it. So it's good. It's just good action economy. But yeah, coordinated attack. I loved using coordinated attack in the playtest. Uh, you can empower a target ally. This is just out of the battle master, but we modified it. So um, when you can take, uh, you can empower a target ally you can see that can see or hear you to use their reaction to make an opportunity attack. Rolling one power die per mana channeled, adding the highest result of those power dice to that ally's attack roll. So, like, um, I was rolling d8s. So, if I spent two mana, I could roll two eight-sided die and give them the best result. The other die is burned. 
So there's a there's a there's an action there's a there's an efficiency there. Once you get around two or three mana spent, you're probably gonna roll above average. So there's not unless you really need to stick that hit, you don't need to spend four or five mana on it. Two mana is typically enough. And if you're using the uh, the empowered maneuvers, I could sacrifice an attack to get a free point of mana that I could then use my bonus action and I can effectively do it for free. without not, I don't have to use my mana pool because by using my action economy, I'm, I'm basically generating a free point of mana as like a momentum thing to be able to then spend that mana on because I ate up my action economy. So my round goes by faster. I have more chances of doing something effective. And a lot of this stuff is designed to help my team do more stuff. So you become a really powerful um, uh, support character by giving up your attacks to give more bonuses to your to your allies. But but maneuvers can be used as actions and as bonus actions, and you can do them both in the same round. So if I wanted to, I could use coordinated attack twice. Target you, you make a reaction, you do the same thing. So you just gave out two free attacks to your team. So cool stuff that you can do. Uh, that's what uh, that's what empowered maneuvers. Uh, that's what yeah empowered maneuvers does, and everyone has access to empowered maneuvers. Um, and then there are um, uh, em, uh, ba, 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 empowered attacks. Beginning at fifth level, when you take the attack action, and if you hit with your first attack, you can forgo your second attack to get a free point of mana that you could then spend on a strike. So if I hit you with the first attack, if I skip my second attack, I could automatically gain a free point of mana to deal extra damage and to trigger one of my strike effects. So a fighter that has frenzied attack active has five attacks because he's sustaining the extra attack. If I hit with my first attack, I can then forego my next four attacks and get four free points of mana to channel a four level strike. So I can do like at 17th level an extra 40, 10 damage every round as long as I hit with the first attack. So not bad, not bad. If I hit, if I miss with the first, like I can hit with two, three, four attacks. That fourth attack I hit, I've got an extra attack left over because of frenzy. I can then sacrifice that one and just get a free point of mana. So I can like regular attack one, regular attack two, regular attack three. Fourth attack I hit, I'm now going to spend my frenzied attack to get a free point of mana so I can channel a strike for free. There you go. But at 17th level, I have a shitload of mana. I can just dump that all in on top of it. So I can get things for free. Uh, stunning strike, fifth level. Uh, starting at fifth level, when you hit with an unarmed or natural weapon attack, unarmed, uh, when you hit with an unarmed, uh, yeah, an unarmed or natural weapon attack, you can deal a, an amount of additional weapon damage equal to one power die per point of mana burned, and the target must make a Constitution saving throw. If it fails, it's stunned until the end of its turn. There you go. Um, a little bit, a little bit tighter on the action economy, guaranteed to deal extra damage with it, whether you get the stun or not. And it's not so long that it doesn't feel horrible to get caught inside of a stun lock because the stun ends at the end of its turn. So if the monk comes after you again to do it again, you have reactions open to potentially prevent that from happening. So, and so if you have creatures, like if you have bosses and stuff that have like villain actions, lair actions, and legendary actions, or is using opportunist, then you'll have more uh, opportunity attacks available for you to be able to use your action economy with. Uh, whirlwind attack, I love whirlwind attack. Uh, fifth level, optional class feature. As an attack, you can burn mana to attack enemies around you that you can see in a blur of motion. The whirlwind attack table below shows how many targets you can attack and how far from you each of these targets can be. Make a separate melee attack against each of these targets using any combination of natural, unarmed, or melee weapons that you're holding and proficient with. Each target hit takes one power die of additional damage for each mana burn this way, up to the max channel limit gained as a monk. So a fifth level monk can attack two targets that are at least, that are 15 feet apart from you. And, it, and I have to spend at least one mana to do so. And, and if I do, I just I deal my weapon attack damage plus an extra D8. If at 17th level, I could dump five mana into it, or I could just dump one mana, my choice. Like if I'm clearing out a mook, like, like, a, like a minion mob that only have one hit point anyway, then I can hit all five of them and just dump, and I'm just automatically gonna deal damage. So I can kill all of them with that effect. It only costs me one mana to do it. But I'm a high enough level that they can be 30 feet apart from each other. And then as a kicker effect, um, I could then spend an additional point of mana to teleport to an unoccupied space within five feet of that target I attack. Neat stuff. Uh, now, now that we've gotten through the array of stuff that monks get for free, 
uh, we can actually get into the traditions. And now, just like with spellcasters, every martial power character gets a stack of free powers uh, when they get access to their uh, third level class, fifth level, ninth level, thirteenth, and seventeenth level class. Here's uh, like <laughs> way of mercy gets chef and poisoner as feats. Um, they're feats. They're fun. They're free. There you go. Um, field medic, veterinary training, swift resuscitation, great fortitude, curse of enfeeblement, strange metabolism, lethargy, life stealing strike. And we, we don't care about what level it is that you're getting access to. It's because you can always upcast. You can always dump more mana into something. It's just when you get access to it. And mostly the powers that you get access to is based off of the themes of the subclass. Like feats are free to use. And way of the way of mercy, you, know, you have those like uh, you have like the, the the hand of poison, and the hand of healing, right? So getting the poisoner feet makes a lot of sense, and so does chef, because you can do things that help heal people, and you can do things that poison people. So like that's just kind of like that's just they call it ludo narrative when the, the when the the description the narrative of something complements the mechanics that the thing can do. So I think that's good ludo. Um, so let's go into the features. I think I have to do some cleanup on these features. So I'm going to catch up on the text over here. And how, how many... Oh, God, it's like 115. Uh, it also has the entire mana... It also has the entire hex crawl system at the back end of it. Uh, there's also all the power gear stuff, like uh, magic weapons are called... Pa like, like magic items are called power gear. There's also the conversion kit for adding powers to monsters uh, based on what their CR is, is the maximum rank of power that they gain access to. And the entire hex crawl, color magic, land crawl system. All of that sits inside of 114 pages raw. When I actually publish this, uh, I'll probably make the I'll probably make the Ravnica Rubble Crawl a separate book. Um, but I will include all the character and monster and magic item stuff in the same book. After editing, uh, after formatting page layouts and artwork, it'll probably be 120 pages, and it'll probably take me a year and a half to get it done. So um, keep an eye out for this, like late 2025. Um, that's that's if I'm lucky, maybe I'll get it done by July 2025. But I anticipate November. There you go. My shit takes forever, but I'll do it all here on stream, and we'll be making we'll be painting Ravnica and Avatar characters basically. Oh yeah, and and thanks Goblin for the suggestion. Um, since paradigms are narrative, it's just a way of dividing up your mana, light and dark force, so I can have you know lightsaber people do that kind of stuff. Um, let's see, Hand of Healing, uh, so now we're getting into it. So, Hand of Healing, third level ability, as an action or bonus action, you can touch, it, it, of course you can do them both. You can touch a creature or yourself and heal a number of hit points equal to the result of one power die per mana burn, plus your channeling modifier. And the Monk's channeling modifier is uh, Dexterity, Strength, and Wisdom. Now you can pick one of those to be your channeling feature, uh, your channeling ability score. At 5th level, when you use Flurry of Attacks, you can replace one attack with a Hand of Healing, rolling one power die at no cost. You can add more mana to increase the total hit points healed or to add kicker effects as detailed below. Uh, hand of Harm, 3rd level, you can deal necrotic damage when you hit with an unarmed attack. Cool. Physician's Touch, 6th uh, level, no change. But at, at 13th level, when using the Hand of Healing, you can spend 4 mana to grant the target the benefit of a greater restoration. Cool. And when using the Hand of Harm, a creature does not benefit from any immunity to the poison condition. Oh, that's neat. So you, sh you disable poison conditions. So now Hand of Harm is always effective. That's cool. Because we have a lot of poisoning effects in here. That's useful. Uh, Flurry of Healing and Harm. 11th level. You can now use both attacks during a Flurry of Attacks to heal instead of only one. When you make use of... When you make use of the, when you make use of a flurry of attacks, thank you. With the hand of harm, your unarmed attack deal one power die of necrotic damage without channeling any mana. You can add additional mana to increase this damage up to, uh, up to five additional dice at 17th level with five mana. Uh, I could probably word that better, but it gets the point across. And the hand of ultimate mercy. Uh, no changes, but uh, regain five power dice plus channeling modifier hit points. And what does it do? It says no changes. So what, are, what does it actually do? Let's pull this out. 
when it says no changes, we should really reference what the changes are or what, what the baseline is. Uh, your mastery of life energy opens the door to the ultimate mercy as an action. You can touch the corpse of, an, of a creature that died within 24 hours and expend five key. The creature then returns to life, regaining a number of hit points equal to 40, 10 plus wisdom modifier. If the creature died while subject to any of the following condition, revives with them removed. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. Okay, that's our baseline. So no changes, but... Um, Let's see. Regain. Oh, uh, but uh, but uh, the number of hit points gained equals five power dice plus channeling modifier uh, equals five d ten. Uh, There's a chance you could use a. You might be able to have a different power die. So um, I, I don't want to say I want to hard code as five d ten because a monk could be using five d twelves. So, yeah, a monk would, at 17th level, a monk would be doing D12. So it would be 5D12. Um, power dice plus channeling modifier hit points. And there is no limit to how often you can use this feature. <laughs> there you go. Uh, way of Shadow. So, Blind Sense. That makes perfect sense. Skulker is a great feat. Ambush uh, gives you uh, a power dice uh, to add to your, uh, your initiative modifier. Vanish. Vanush. Vanish is um, you spend one mana... Uh, you become uh, invisible until the beginning of your next round. It doesn't end if you do something. It's just it, it, you just become invisible. Um, subtle channeling uh, is an exploit. When you do this, um, that your channeling is undetectable. So you can stay hidden and affect people with stuff. Blinding strike blinds people when you hit them. Empowered synergy. When you use a bonus action, you can make an attack as part of that bonus action regardless of what it was. So if uh, empowered, uh, empowered synergy, if I'm making a flurry attack, if I'm using flurry of attacks as a bonus action, I could then spend two mana and get a third attack as part of my flurry of attacks. That's just, it's so sick. Uh, Flicker Pounce is a 30 foot teleport. And when I arrive, I attack with advantage. And, and if I successfully hit, I can teleport back to where I came from. If I miss the attack, I'm stuck in front of the opponent. But, uh, but Flicker Pounce is super sick. And then the assassin, uh, and then the, uh, sorry, assassinating, what is it, assassinating damage? Is that what, we changed the name on that. This is why we're doing this. Because we've had updates since being here last time. So uh, that's an exploit. Let's go find it. Yeah, assassinating damage. And ghost walker, which is you become incorporeal. There you go, walk through shit. Uh, let's see. Uh, Dark Stalker, third level. Uh, as an action, you can tap or lock. Uh, you can tap one mana. I don't need to say lock because you automatically lock it if you want to. Uh, you tap one mana to create a sphere of shadows that emanates from you in a 10-foot radius. This sphere is centered on you, moves with you, and it lasts for as long as you sustain it or until you are incapacitated or die. The shadows turn dim light in, within 10 feet of you into darkness and bright light in the same area to dim light. In addition... Sound is dampered within the sphere, granting advantage to dexterity. Stealth checks while the sphere is present. The sphere of shadows effective spell level is equal to your max rank of power gained as a monk for determining if a light spell area will dispel the sphere. You can see normally in darkness, both magical and non-magical, to a distance of 120 feet. Which sound, I mean, it's different from blind sense because you can actually be blinded and your dark vision doesn't work. So those things are useful together. Uh, but yeah, that's a major. That's basically stealing some of uh, cleric twilight, uh, twilight cleric ability, and blending it with the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the way of shadow to make it much more utilitarian, and uh, and really useful. Um, so let's see, six level, you gain the ability to step from one shadow into another, uh, when you are in dim light or in darkness, which is whenever you have your bubble effect active. Uh, as a maneuver, which can be either an action or a, or a bonus action, like we discussed before, you can teleport up to 60 feet to an unoccupied space that you can see that is also in dim light or in darkness. And it's listed as a maneuver, which means that I can trigger um, the um, uh, empowered synergy. So when I trigger this teleportation effect, I could gain, I could gain empowered synergy as early as 5th level, but I get it for free at 13th. 
so I don't have to prepare it anymore. It's always available. But I could at any time use Empowered Synergy whenever I teleport. So uh, as a maneuver, I can teleport up to 60 feet to an unoccupied space that I can see that is also in dim light or in darkness. Uh, you can then uh, you then have advantage on the first melee attack you make before the end of your turn. So if I were to use Empowered Synergy along with my Shadow Step, I would then be able to teleport to the result, attack you as part of the same bonus action, and make so it with advantage. If I were to blend a, a sixth level monk with, like, say, an assassin rogue, that could get really sick really fast. Uh, let's see. Cloak of Shadow. By 11th level, you've learned to become one with the shadows. When you are in an area of dim light or darkness, which is whenever you're in your bubble, which is permanent, you are now invisible as a maneuver, uh, which you could do as an action or as a bonus action. Uh, you remain invisible until you make an attack, cast a spell, or in an area of bright light, uh, which is impossible as long as your bubble stays active. Uh, you can dismiss the effect during your turn without taking an action. There you go. Shadow Pounce. When you, t uh, when you gain 17th level, you can strike from the shadows with deadly speed. When you, uh, when you use the shadow step feature as a bonus action, you can spend one mana to use Flurry of Blows as part of your bonus action. You have advantage on both of these attacks. So, And then you can use Empowered Strike with it to get a third attack, which would also be an advantage. Um, so yeah, that all that language stays clean, so we can keep moving on. Way of the Ascended Dragon, super fucking sick. Mobile, alert feats, Lycanthrope to take on the, a visit. Okay, so if you don't know what Lycanthropy is, it is a sustained effect. I hope you guys are having fun, because I fucking love this stuff. Lycanthrope. While sustain, it's a first rank power, so you can have it at first level. While sustaining this power, you can shift, from, uh, you can shift form into a Lycanthrope creature. Your appearance changes to adopt features of a creature of your choice, such as fur, scales, beak, claw, fangs, tails, etc., and gain the following benefits. Heightened senses. You gain, uh, you gain advantage on wisdom, perception, and investigation checks. Feral might. You now have advantage on strength checks. Natural weapons. Gain unarmed attack that deal one power die plus strength or dexterity modifier. Slashing or piercing damage. There you go. So those are the cool things that you get and so the way of ascended dragon you get you could have it at first level if you want to pay for it but at fifth level it becomes free and then your uh and then your visage is always that of a dragon uh dire impact uh, you can add your channeling uh, dire impact is a sustained power one mana um you can add your channel um your max channel your channel uh, your max the max rank of power you can channel is the amount of damage that you can add to uh, to any attacks. So like uh, at 5th level, it's a plus 2, so it would be plus 2. At 17th level, it's a plus 5. So Dire Impact would always do plus 5 whenever you make an, uh, a weapon attack. Deadly Presence scares things. Intimidate and Deadly Presence scares things at a distance that you look at them. Intimidating Strike scares them after you hit them with and deal damage. Uh, blind Sense, you know what that is. Wave of Terror is uh, uh, uh i'm sorry deadly presence deals damage to creatures when they're within uh within melee attack range of you a uh, wave of terror creates a fear effect to everybody within a 30 foot space around you we talked about indestructible earlier which leans into dragons being immune to that type of damage and then explosive strike kind of simulates a breath weapon effect now let's get into the actual features Draconic Disciple, Draconic Presence. When you use, uh, you you can use this once per long rest or spend one key to regain use of the feature. What what is it? Rogue, no. Monk. Way of us into a dragon. Uh, you can channel draconic power to magically uh, to magnify your presence and imbue your unarmed strikes with the essence of uh, dragon's breath. You gain the following benefits: draconic presence, um, draconic. draconic presence, draconic strike. Uh, when you damage a target with unarmed strike, you can. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, you can. Okay, draconic presence. Uh, if you fail a charisma check. You can use your reaction to re-roll the check as you tap into the Mighty Presence of Dragon. Once this feature turns to failure, 
Uh, once this feature turns a failure into a success, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. Or you can spend one mana and get access to it again. Uh, spend one mana. That's how old this is. I'm still calling it key. Draconic Strike. So when you damage a target with unarmed strikes, you can deal acid, cold, fire, lightning, or poison damage. When you spend mana... To Am I using mana up the line here? Mana, yeah. Mana, 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 mana. Okay. Oh, wow, that's how long it's been since I've looked at this. Uh, when you spend uh, when you spend mana to channel a martial strike through an unarmed, unarmed strike, the additional damage can be the same damage chosen for the unarmed strike. Like if you choose to deal fire damage, but you're using a shocking strike, shocking strike deals lightning damage, but if you chose to do fire damage with your Draconic Strike, you could instead do fire damage. There you go. Or you could do unarmed damage. It's up to you. Uh, which would be like bludgeoning. Worth noting. Uh, your unarmed strikes... Okay, uh, whenever you hit with an unarmed attack, you can choose to deal bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage. And your unarmed strikes are considered to be weapons worth at least one silver piece that possesses the finesse and light weapon properties for use with spells, feats, and features requiring these prerequisites. So you could, like, uh, if you were a, like a, a, a monk, sorcerer, hybrid, you could use, like, shadow blade. You could, you could enchant your hands to become shadow blades, for instance, if you wanted to do that. Uh, when you spend mana to channel martial power through on our strike, the additional damage can be chosen. There you go. And then Tongue of the Dragon, no changes. Uh, Tongue of the Dragon, learn to speak, read, and write Draconic or one other language of your choice. The end. Okay. Breath of the Dragon, regain use with two. Uh, you can channel destructive waves of energy like those created by the dragon you immolate when you take the attack action on your turn. You can replace one of the attacks with an, exalt, with an exhalation of Draconic energy in either a 20-foot cone or a 30-foot line. That is five feet wide, your choice. Choose a damage type, but each uh, creature in that area must make a dexterity saving throw against your key saving throw DC. Taking damage of the chosen type equal to two rolls of your martial arts die on a failed save or half as much on a success. In 11th level, it becomes three dice. And you can use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. While you have no uses available, you can spend two key to use this feature again. Uh, power dice is what we replace it with, and you can burn one mana to empower your breath with one combat mastery power you know. That affects any... Oh my god, I forgot about that. Holy shit, that's great. Okay, so uh, you can burn one mana. So I deal the damage as an area of effect, and as part of that area of effect, I can use a combat mastery. Combat masteries are like weapon masteries. They're cantrips that you can use at any time with any weapon, any time you hit. It's not with a specific weapon once per turn, this is ba it's basically a combat cantrip that is like a, a zero cost strike effect that deals no additional damage. So there's Addle, which is make a con save and, uh, and you cannot make an opportunity attack until the end of your next turn. Disarm, uh, you drop a health weapon. Grapple, um, it's for melee only, so that wouldn't qualify. Push, target makes a strength saving throw, is pushed five feet. Step. Um, which wouldn't make much sense because you're not targeting a creature with the breath weapon, but straggle targets make con save or speed is reduced to half trip. Uh, target makes a saving throw or is prone vex target makes an intelligence saving throw or is at disadvantage on their next attack roll until the end of the turn. So I could, I can learn any of these as a, as a power. Like I, I can, instead of learning a strike or whatever, I can learn these. And so when I use Breath of Dragon at 11th level, I could burn a point of mana, and everyone that's affected by my Breath Weapon now gets affected by any one of these masteries that I know. And I can learn all of them if I'm a high enough level, if I wanted to. So that's super cool. Um, if anyone that knows 3rd Edition, there was something called a Dragon Adept. It was a character class that was kind of like a Warlock, but all the invocations uh, were... Uh, you had a Breath Weapon uh, uh, attack. Um, um, yeah, you had a Breath Weapon attack. And all the invocations you took modified the breath weapon. Like, uh, kind of like Repelling Blast for the Warlock these days pushes a target uh, 10 feet every time they get hit. 
the uh, Dragon Shaman. Uh, yeah, that's what it's called, Dragon Shaman. The Dragon Shaman. Was it Dragon Shaman or Dragon Adept? I think it was Dragon... Whoa, there we go. I think it was Dragon Adept. Um, had a, a stack of invocations that you would then be able to use your breath weapon with. And then it does all these things. This is kind of that same idea. Uh, Wings Unfurled modifies a six-level feature. Uh, while using Artem Mobility, you can tap or lock two mana to unfurl spectral draconic wings from your back that vanish when you dismiss the power. While the wings exist, you have a flying speed equal to your walking speed. That is basically, and then you lock that power on, it's permanent. So you basically gain permanent flight at sixth level. There you go, Bobby Uh Aspect of the worm, no changes. Uh, the power of your spirit now radiates from you, warding your enemies or inspiring fear in your enemies. Uh, as a bonus action, you can create an aura of draconic power that radiates 10 feet from you for one minute. For the duration, you gain one of the following features. No changes, huh? Um, let's see. Resistance to damage. Or once you create this aura, you can't create it again until you finish a long short rest unless you expend three key to create it again, which is just built into it. So there you go. Ascended Aspect. Uh, let's see, Ascended, ascended Aspect. Uh, your Draconic Spirit reaches its peak. Uh, augmented Breath. Uh, you can use a Breath Weapon. You can spend one, chi, uh, one key or one mana to augment the shape of the power. Uh, the exhalation of the Dragon Energy becomes either a 60 foot cone or a 90 foot cone. That is five feet wide, your choice. Each creature, I uh, can spend one key to do that. No reason to change it. Uh, Blind sight. Uh, you gain. Oh, okay, I gain all these things. Blind sight. I get blind sight. That's cool. Did I get blind sight? I don't have it, right? I have blind sense at thirteen, and then I have blind sight. Is that redundant? This clicks in at seventeenth level. Blind sense. Oh, it's only 10 feet. Fuck you. Uh, our blind sense at third, at 17th level, our blind sense is going to be 50 feet. So value added. Uh, explosive fury. When you activate your aspect, the worm draconic uh, fury explodes from you. Uh, it deals 3d10 acid, fire blah. Uh, we instead... Uh, you can burn one mana to add a fourth power die to the damage. Uh, explosive fury. There we go. There, now it becomes relevant. Uh, Brother Dragon needs to own key. There you go, no change. There we go. All right, Astral Self. What time is it? Nine o'clock? Time to rock. Um, subtle channeling, mobile, radiant strike, makes sense, phase, awesome, power armor, power shield, anchor, flicker pounce, ghost walker, banishing strike, great set. Uh, features, armor of the astral self, third level. Your mastery of your mana allows you to summon a portion of your astral self as a bonus action. You can spend one mana to summon the arms of your astral self when you do so. Each creature of your choice that can see you within 10 feet of you must make a dexterity saving throw or take force damage equal to two rolls of your martial powers, uh, of your martial arts die, of your power die. As a first rank sustained power, these spectral arms hover near your shoulders or, around, or surround your arms, your choice. You determine the arm's appearance, and they vanish uh, when you're incapacitated or die. While the spectral arms are present, you gain the following benefits. You can use your channeling ability modifier in place of your strength modifier when making strength checks and strength saving throws. You can use the spectral arms to make unarmed attacks. 
And uh, when you make an unarmed strike with the arms on your turn, your reach, if, uh, your reach, your reach is five feet greater than normal. The unarmed strikes you make with the arms can use your channeling ability modifier in place of your strength or dexterity modifier for the attacks and damage rolls. And their damage type is force. This is a sustained effect. So again, you can just lock this thing on and you permanently have your arms. Visage of the astral self. You can summon the visage of your astral self as a bonus action or as part of the bonus action you take to activate arms of the astral self. You can spend an additional point of mana to sustain this visage as a first rank power. Uh, you can spend an additional point of mana to sustain this visage with the arms together as a combined second rank power. Advantages early if you're incapacitated or die. Uh, the future one is otherwise unchanged. What does it do? The spectral visage covers your face like a helmet or mask. You determine its appearance. While the visage is present, you gain the following benefits. Astral sight. You can see normal in darkness, both magical and dark, up to 120 feet. Wisdom of spirit. You have advantage on wisdom and charisma saving uh, checks. Neat. Uh, word of the spirit. When you speak, you can direct your words to a creature of your choice that you can see within 60 feet of you, making it so only that creature can hear you. Or you can amplify your feet so everyone can hear within 600 feet. Neat. Body of the astral self. 11th level. While sustaining both your arms and visage, you can cause the body of the astral self to appear. No action required. Uh, this spectral body covers your physical form like a suit of armor, connecting with the arms and the visage. Your, you determine its appearance. While the spectral body is present, you gain the following benefits. Deflect energy. You have, when you take damage, you can use reaction to deflect it. When doing so, the damage you take is reduced by D10. Plus your channeling ability modifier, minimum reduction of one. Uh, empowered arms, that's 11th level, is reduced. By one. Power, die, plus your channeling ability modifier, minimum reduction of... It can't be less than one because you're doing a... Uh, I guess it does matter because you got have a, a negative... Uh, empowered arms. Uh, when you hit a target with arms of the actual self, you can deal extra damage to the target equal to your equal to one power die. And awakened actual self. Oh, why does it say third level? The seventeenth level. Thank you. Your connection to your astral self is complete, allowing you to unleash its full potential. As a bonus action, you can sustain four mana to summon the arms, visage, and body of your astral self and awaken it while sustained. This, awaken, this awakening ends early if you are incapacitated or die. While the astral self is awakened, you gain the following benefits. Now, this is four mana. Um, you can sustain this. It's basically permanently on. And uh, Armor of the Spirit, gain plus two bonus armor class, Astral Barrage, uh, whenever, you, uh, whenever you use the extra attack feature to attack twice, you can instead attack three times if all the attacks are made with your Astral Arms. When you, when you use the extra attack feature, Oh, that, oh, that's fifth level. Got it. Uh, when you use... Um, let's see. I want to word that differently. Whenever you use the attack action... You gain three attacks instead of two. Empowered 
maneuvers with the empowered maneuvers and empowered attack features. Value. Alternatively, you can forgo the two extra attacks. Oh, there you go. Yep, better language. Better language. Better language. Way of the I love Way of the Drunken Master. It's so fun. Uh, Savage Attacker makes sense. Defensive Duelist makes sense. Strange Metabolism makes sense. Makes you immune to poison. Uh, crouching Stance also makes sense. Um, crouching Stance is pretty cool. Check this out. Uh, let's go find it. Crouching Stance. When you channel this power, you gain the following abilities. When, when you sustain this power, that's the wording I should be using. When you sustain this power, you gain the following abilities. You can crawl and stand from prone without requiring additional movement. Attack rolls made against you while you're prone by creatures within five feet. Do not have it. Uh, do, um, uh, attack rolls made against you while prone by creatures within five feet don't have advantage. Attacks that you make while prone don't have disadvantage. And you gain advantage on dexterity stealth checks while you're prone. Like that's that's just that's just some great value. That is like some ninja crawl shit. Um, let's see. So that's a great thing to have, um, especially for the dragon master falling down all the time. You can basically fall down, stand up, roll around. It's all the same action economy. You can just spend all your time like doing um, like Brazilian jiu jitsu stuff just on the ground and not have anything against you for it. Uh, moving target allows you to hit things as they travel through your space. Uh, tripping attack, there you go. Fickle fate, um, that lets you reroll dice. Uh, one's own luck, uh, gives you advantage on die rolls. Delusional, uh, delusional strike confuses people, and then frenzied attack gives you extra attacks. So that's a sick, that's a sick set. Uh, bonus proficiencies, you gain the skilled feat, gaining proficiency in performance, brewer supplies, and a skill tool or musical instrument of your choice. Drunken Technique no changes, Tipsy Sway no changes. Uh, Drunkard's Luck, starting at 11th level, you always seem to get a lucky bounce at the right moment. When you make an ability check, an attack roll, or a saving throw and have disadvantages on the roll, you can spend one mana point to cancel the disadvantage. You can spend one mana point. Oh, there you go. You can spend one mana point. Uh, you can spend one point of mana, one point of mana to cancel the disadvantage on that roll. <laughs> Expensive, but not bad. Um, let's see, is that, that's that's normally a key thing, right? Oh, it's two key over here, fuck you. Jesus Christ, that's so, ex why do you guys think this advantage is so expensive? You have no idea how to balance your own game. Whatever, dude. Uh, well, uh, while sustaining flurry of attacks, you can make up to three attacks instead of two. That's just, oh, that's awesome. Um, let's see. Way of the, oh, way of the four elements is super sick. Uh, way of the four elements, C Marshall, uh, C elemental key. There you go. Um, you can just free and again, full preview. The entire book is here for you to take a look at. If you find value in the stuff that I do, um, read it. If you like it, please buy it. Uh, it encourages it encourages more behavior like this. If you do, let's see. Yeah, and then if it's a spell casting ability, you can't lock it because you're because you're mixing um, spell casting with powers. Uh, for level gain elemental attunement, uh, power list, um, for a deeper dive, see elemental key on DM's guild. <clears throat> mm 
these are all the these are all the abilities that are already inside of the elemental keybook. So I'm just gonna skip past that. You can see that your leisure. I know that stuff is good. Uh, oh god, Kensei is so fucking cool. Um, you get the step mastery. So whenever you hit with an attack, you can take a five foot step without attack of opportunity. Dire impact allows you to add your channeling um, your your max channeling rank to your damage. Faint uh, allows you to uh, roll a power dice to get extra attack when you're attacking with a weapon. Gifted Artisan allows you to roll additional dice to improve um, artsy die rolls. Um, parry allows you to reduce damage. Evasive Footwork increases your armor class when you move. Extended Attack gives you additional reach. Opportunist is a sustained effect that allows you to convert attacks during your attack action into additional opportunity attacks during other people's turns. Moving target is a reaction. It allows you to make an opportunity attack against a creature whenever it moves within uh, within reach of your weapon attack, even if it's forced movement, even if it's using disengage. And then frenzied attack, of course, gives you an extra attack. Uh, Path of the Kinsei, part three, agile parry. Uh, while wielding a weapon you are proficient with, you gain a plus two armor class. Okay. Kinsei shot. While wielding a ranged weapon, you can use a bonus action to add one power die of damage to any ranged attack you make until the beginning of your next turn. You can use your bonus action. Oh, it's for free. Neat. Uh, it's just a bonus action. That's really cool. Uh, artist in training. You gain the skilled feat, gaining proficiency with calligraphy tools in any two skills, tools, or languages of your choice. Uh, one with the blade. Magical Kinsei Weapon. You gain two weapon damage types of your choice listed in the powers section below. One basic and one advanced type. You can change these types of damage when you gain a new level. One basic and one advanced. So, instead of learning a power or instead of learning a feat, you can learn a type of damage. Pick a damage type. Any attack you make uses it. So at first level, you could pick a basic damage type, acid, cold, fire, lightning, and poison. So like if I'm making an attack with a bow, uh, I could always do lightning damage if I choose lightning. And when I'm attacking with a dagger, uh, when I make a melee attack, I could always do cold damage. If I'm attacking with a fist, I could always use fire damage. There you go, poison bite, you know? And then at fifth level, it's advanced force, necrotic, psychic, radiant, thunder, Bob's your uncle. Love that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, one with blade six level. That 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 jives. Um, let's see. Death strike. Spend one mana as an exploit to gain advantage and add one power die to your attack roll. Oh my god, that's so good. <laughs> so good. Sharpen the blade. Eleventh. At eleventh level, you gain the ability to augment your weapons further with your power as a sustained effect. You tap. Um, you tap one mana. To gain a plus three bonus to attack and damage rolls with a weapon you're proficient with. This feature has no effect on a magic weapon that already has a bonus to attack and damage roll. And then uncanny, uh, unerring accuracy is... God, say so good. <clears throat> um... Interesting. Okay. Unerring accuracy. At 17th level, your mastery of weapons grants you extraordinary accuracy. If you miss with an attack uh, using a monk weapon, you on your turn, you can reroll it. You can use this feature only once on each of your turns. Okay. Kinsei weapon. Huh. Uh, when you reach 17th level of this class, you can choose another type of weapon. Either weapon or to be a Kinsei weapon for you. Oh, yeah. That's silly. Um, the uh, Just so as you know, is uh, one of the things. Um... You're proficient with all simple and martial weapons. And can say weapon, uh, death strike, one with the blade. I feel like I'm missing something. Can say weapons. Here we go. I 
Agile parry. Oh, Kinsei weapons. Okay, I'm missing that. I can't believe I don't have this included here. How silly. Um, you can treat um, any weapon you are proficient with is considered a monk weapon, period. Way of the Long Death. How are we doing here? Way of the Cobalt Souls. Bullshit. We can ignore that. One, two, three. Okay, three to go. Hey, we got this. One, two, three. And when we come back at lunchtime tomorrow, we'll work through the Ranger and the Paladin. Um, actually, we should probably get through. We might be able to get through Paladin tonight. It's 9 15. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Uh, long death, necrotic strike, field medic, sure. Necrotic damage, Swiss resuscitation, great. Life stealing strike, dire impact, sure. Curse of the fallen puppet. Uh, we took the entire Blood Hunter um, um, emo class that uh, Mercer had created and put on DM's Guild. We took the entire, we took everything from um, the. Um, um, yeah, from the Blood Hunter, and we convert it to martial powers. So you could be a Ranger Blood Hunter, you could be a Paladin Blood Hunter, a Monk Blood Hunter. All of the curses, uh, effects, uh, class features, uh, virtually all of it's inside of here. Uh, Curse of the Fallen Puppet, that's awesome. Daunting Presence, sure. Assassinating Damage is awesome. Rider Revival, perfect. God, what a great mix. Uh, Touch of Death, no changes. Hour of Reaping, no changes. Well, now I'm just compelled to see. I think uh, I think the um, I think Bloodhunter makes an awesome ranger, honestly. Taking all taking all of those curses and and effects or whatever those things are called and converting them into powers that a ranger could then spend mana on to use or sustain. Oh, that's so cool. Uh, let's see, touch of death. Starting when you choose this power at third, uh, you study death allows you to extract vitality from another creature as it nears its demise. When you reduce a creature within five feet of you to zero hit points, you gain temporary hit points equal to your wisdom modifier plus your monk level, minimum of one temporary hit points. Okay, let's do this instead. When you reduce a creature to zero, reduce a creature within five feet. When you reduce a creature, when, when you reduce a creature to zero HP, that is within reach of your weapon attack you gain a number of temporary hit points equal to one power die plus your channeling ability modifier minimum of one Alternatively, you can regain one point of mana. Do I want to do that? Bag of rats. There's a bag of rat problem here. Yep. Bag of bats. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't work. Um, yeah, can't use the mana because that's too fueling. And the, the feature itself doesn't work at all. Uh, here's uh, here's how I want to modify that. Um, here's 
during combat when a creature that has dealt damage to you is reduced to zero hit points while within reach of your weapon attack. You gain a number of temporary hit points equal to one power die. And it's temporary hit points. It's not healing, directly healing. So that, yeah, the mana doesn't work. Can't heal the mana. And you can get rid of Bag of Rats by it has to have damaged you. And it has to be in combat. I, I, that's a little bit more limiting because touch of death, bloody blah. But I like it. Uh, Hour of Reaping. Um, sixth level, you gain the ability to unsettle and terrify those around you as an action for your soul has been touched by a shadow of death, blah. When you take this action, each creature within 30 feet of you that can see you must succeed a wisdom saving throw or be frightened of you until the end of the next turn. Great. Mastery of Death. You use your familiarity with death to escape its grasp. When you are reduced to zero hit points, you can burn one mana, no action required, to have one hit point instead. I love that. Uh, touch of Law and Death. Starting at 17th level, uh, your touch can channel the energy of death into a creature. As an action, you touch one creature within five feet of you and you can burn... 1 to 10 mana. The target must make a constitution saving throw and takes 2d10 necrotic damage per mana on a failed save or half as much damage on a successful one. Poof, wow. That's insane. I love it. Way of the open hand. Fighting initiate. That's great. Gain a fighter, basically a combat maneuver. Uh, tavern Brawler um, makes sense. Regeneration, sure. Grappling Strike, perfect. Close Quarters Combat. Close Quarter Combat is a sustained power. Basically, it allows you to uh, automatically grapple uh, whenever you make an attack roll. Um, deflection um, is um, 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 reduce uh, attack rolls by your power die. Opportunist allows you to convert your attacks into opportunity attacks. Uh, restraining hold, moving target. A restraining hold is whenever you have grappling, uh, you burn one mana and the target becomes restrained. Uh, moving target is a reaction. You can hit targets that move through your area. And then hypertunistic is whenever you make an opportunity attack. Um, whenever you hit a creature with an opportunity attack, you can make another attack. Uh, basically, you can, you can double tap as a reaction. <clears throat> and of course... Opportunity attacks can trigger strikes. Uh, open hand techniques. Starting when you choose this tradition at third level, you can choose four combat masteries to add to your list of powers known. And you can add an additional combat mastery when you gain another rank of power as a monk. Let's make sure we still have... Let's, let's verify how many combat masteries we currently have in the game. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There you go. So open hand, you get basically all, eventually you get all combat masteries for free. Uh, this is in addition to any powers that you gained with his archetype. Nice. With this tradition. Uh, sixth level, you can heal yourself as a maneuver. Healing a number of hit points equal to a number of power dice equal to the number of mana. Hmm. You, um, healing a number, hmm. Of hit points equal to uh, as a, um, as you can heal yourself as a maneuver. Uh, rolling a number of power dice equal to uh, the mana burned, gaining that many hit, uh, gain that many hit points. Oh, and you can. Period. You can also spend hit dice when healing this way, spending a number of hit dice up to the maximum rank of power gained as a monk. There you go. Double tap. Tranquility. Beginning at 11th level, you can enter a special meditation that surrounds you with an aura of peace. As a sustained power, you can channel one mana to maintain the sanctuary spell, targeting only yourself as a sustained power so you this is locked on you can channel one mana 
to sustain the sanctuary spell, targeting only yourself. A creature attempting to attack you, as described in the spell, must make a wisdom saving throw against your channeling DC. The effect has no duration when sustained and ends normally as described in the spell, burning the mana when it ends as normal. Quivering palm. You gain the ability to set up lethal vibrations in someone's body. And when you hit the creature with an unarmed attack, you can spend five mana as a strike power to start these imperceptible vibrations. Uh, is that right? What is Quivering Palm supposed to be? Three key? I need it five. As a strike power, sorry, imperceptible vibrations. Uh, which lasts for a number of days equal to your monk level. The vibrations are harmless unless you trigger the vibrations. Uh, to do so, the target must be on the same plane of existence when you trigger the vibrations. The target must make a con save. Fail equals zero hit points. Success equals 10d10 necrotic damage. You can only have one, you can have only one creature. When you hit a creature with an unarmed strike, Trigger the vibrations. Last for eh, as an action. Uh, the vibrations are harmless unless you trigger the vibrations to end them as an action or a bonus action. Thank you. Uh, they gotta be on the same plane of existence. They either drop to zero or 10 to 10 necrotic. There you go. Uh, you can only have one creature under the effect of this at a time. You can choose to end the vibrations harmlessly without using any action. There you go. Sun Soul, the last one on the monk set, I believe, right? Yep. Way of the Sun Soul, or also known as Boros Supreme. Fire damage, automatically. Sharpshooter, sure. Fire, uh, power armor, radiant damage, axiom strike, flaming strike, binding strike. Empowering Synergy, Unnatural Resistance, and Opportunist. Good set. <clears throat> Radiant Sun Bolts. Starting when you choose this tradition at third level, you can hurl Searing Bolts of Magical Radiance. Uh, you gain a new attack option that you can use with an attack action. Radiant Sun Bolt is a thrown weapon attack with a range of 30 feet. Uh, this attack counts as a martial arts weapon that you are proficient with, and you add your channeling ability modifier to the attack and damage roll. This damage is radiance, and the damage die is equal to your power die. When you uh, when you attack, when you can attack with a weapon, you can replace that attack, including opportunity attacks when available, with a radiant sunbolt that you can use with any combat masteries, feats, and powers that you know as a normal weapon. There you go. Um... Searing Sun Arc, six, no change. Uh, you gain the ability to channel mana. Um, you gain the ability to channel mana into searing waves of energy as a maneuver. Maneuver, so you can do it both as an action, bonus action, and twice during the same turn if you wish. Uh, you deal one power die of fire damage for each point of mana burned up to your max channel limit gained as a monk to all targets in a 15-foot cone. Affected creatures make a dex save. Uh, for half damage. So I could sacrifice, uh, at, this is 6th level, I could sacrifice both of my attacks to gain 2 points of free mana that I could then do 2 power dice of fire damage in an area of effect, save for half. Not bad. Searing Sunburst, 11th level. And then I can just dump extra mana into it. Uh, let's see. Second, uh, 11th, uh, you gain the ability to create an orb of light as a maneuver and magical create orb and hurl it. At a point, you choose 150 feet. When it erupts into a sphere of radiant light for a brief but deadly instant, each creature that uh, in that 20-foot radius sphere must succeed on con save or take one power die of damage per mana burned. A creature doesn't need to make the save if the uh, a creature doesn't need to make the save if the creature is behind total cover that is opaque. At 17th level, you become wreathed in a luminous magical aura. You shed bright light in a 30-foot radius and dim light for 30 feet. You can extinguish or restore the light as a bonus action. If a creature hits you with a melee attack while this light shines, you can use your reaction as an opportunity attack to deal radiant damage to that creature. The radiant damage equals one power die plus channeling ability modifier. There you go. So, that's Monk. Uh, I think the language is clean. 
Uh, I think we're going to be seeing changes to some of this stuff in 2024, maybe. I'm not sure how much they're going to actually build out in 2024. But, uh, but that's all kosher with how Marshall Power stands right now and, and the modifications that we've already made to the monk using the Elemental Keybook. But I would also like to do like uh, Monks of Light and Shadow where we uh, lean into the uh, Sun Soul and Way of Shadow. Like, uh, like the, um, um, the, the Way of Four Elements gains a, a kit of 40 spells that they can spend mana on. Uh, if I... When I get around after Martial Powers comes out, I'll build uh, the uh, the book uh, the um, uh, the book of light and shadow. I can then create a uh, a spell list for both way of the shadow and way of the sun soul. So you'll have uh, basically like white mana for the uh, sun soul, white and red mana for the sun soul, and you'll have blue and black mana uh, for the um, uh, for the way of shadow. And they'll each have a list of fifty spells. In addition to all the martial power stuff, so it'll be exactly like this is, except that it will be for those classes. Eventually, I want to do all of them this way, have uh, all monks be treated as um, basically a half caster with their own unique kit of fifth, uh, uh, one to fifth level spells plus uh, plus uh, cantrips. So that's the idea, anyway. Key cost zero. These are all cantrips. You know, the best way for a monk to have the feeling of the four elements with infinite spam ability is to give them access to the, the cantrips. It's so fucking easy. It's so obvious. I don't know why it doesn't already exist, but it's it's just it's a really high level quality of life improvement. So uh, where are we at? 929. I gave myself another 15 minutes. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at the Paladin real quick. Um, there's not most of the stuff in the Paladin doesn't need to change. Uh, there are some changes to the class features, but uh, for the most part, oaths don't change. Uh, I went through all of them, and they're all good. But we do have changes to the actual class, um, which is follow channeling class features. There you go. You can use either your strength, wisdom, or charisma as your channeling modifier, and whichever channeling ability score you use, all of your other shit triggers off of that as well. Like like. Aura, blah, blah, blah. All that stuff uses your channeling DC, not your charisma. Uh, you gain mana, two points per level. Uh, you'll have a max of 40 at 20th level. You gain martial powers, just like everyone else. Um, spell casting with power. You can freely mix and match any powers or spells. You have the same set of... You have the same stack. So like a, 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 fifth, level pal, a fifth level paladin, for instance has a total of um, six powers or, or, or six spells. Uh, freely mix and match them. Uh, the Paladin has, um, has all of its known spells. It's bonus spell list. It keeps those. Uh, the Divine Smite spells are removed and you strike powers. Unless, if you don't want to use strike powers, you can keep using Divine Smite. If you, <coughs> so you can either use strike powers or you can use divine smite. I recommend strike powers; they're more versatile. Um, empowered maneuvers. We already know what that is. Sacrifice attacks to get free mana to spend on uh, maneuvers as a bonus action. Lay on hands. I love this. This is so fun. Okay, so a lot of the paladin's identity is disintegrated. Because all martial characters now have access to strikes. So where, where does that take the Paladin? The Paladin has auras, transformations, and lay on hands. That's basically the things that make it stand out from other stuff. So what is that? And it has a spell casting, of course, which is also, because it's a hybrid, that also makes it different. But that leans away from smites. So if you're taking away from its unique identity with smites, and you're giving that to everyone else, how do you lean the, the Paladin into being its own thing? Lean into the divinity aspect. So, divine recovery. As a bonus action, you can spend hit points in your healing pool to regain spent mana. For every five hit points spent in your healing pool, uh, lay on hands. So, we're modifying lay on hands. Um, as, as it stands, you get five hit points per level as a paladin, 100 at 20th level, five at first. As a bonus action, instead of healing somebody, you can spend hit points in your healing pool to regain spent mana. For every five hit points spent in your healing pool, you regain one point of mana. 
you regain a number of points of mana this way each round up to your max channel limit gained as a paladin. So at 5th level, you have a pool of 25 hit points or 5 mana that you can give back to yourself 2 mana per bonus action. Alternatively, as an action, as a bonus action, you give it to yourself. As an action, you can give it to another character. So now the paladin becomes a mana battery. The artificer can create power stones to give them extra mana as, a, as a, an object that they can attune to and then sap mana from. But the paladin itself is its own living power stone that charges up to 20 mana. The paladin gets 40 mana at 20th level. And then if you wanted to be greedy and burn lay on hands on yourself over the course of a day, you get 60 mana instead of just 40. So now you've got a shitload of mana for you to be able to throw around casting spells, throwing out smite abilities, whatever you want to do. Divine Strike replaces Divine Smite at second level. Starting at second level, when you channel a strike power through a melee weapon attack, you roll one additional die of damage equal to your power die. The damage can be radiant instead of the type listed for the strike power's description. So like if I were to use Shocking Strike, I could use Lightning Damage, or I could use Radiant Damage, or I could use the weapon damage, like, like slashing it with a sword. Um, so a paladin spends one point of mana to channel a strike, and you get a free die, an extra power die of damage as a result of it. So, everyone can use strikes. Paladins do it better than everyone else. There you go. Um, the extra strike, uh, this extra die doesn't increase the rank of the strike channel. There you go. It's just free. Channel Divinity modifies Channel Divinity at third level. Harness Divine Power. Okay, so modify the Channel Harness Divine Power at third level. You can burn two mana to regain use of a Channel Divinity, which is awesome. So Channel Divinity basically becomes a unique Paladin-only maneuver, reaction, sustained effect, or strike power. Now, I've gone through all of them before. They're all legit. They all basically feel like a two mana cost. So you get your Channel Divinity once, Spend two mana, you get it back, you can do it again. So you could spend your entire mana pool on, on channeling the divinity if you wanted to. Uh, empowered attacks, beginning at fifth level, because you get you get two mana per level. So you can always burn down your entire mana pool on channel divinity if you wanted to. Which again makes the makes the paladin really unique in what they can do compared to other characters. Uh, optional class featured, empowered attacks. This is, again, when you hit with something, you can forgo attacks to gain free strikes, which stacks with the uh, with the Divine Strike ability. So if I, may, if I have two attacks, if I hit on the first attack, I can sacrifice my other attack to get a free point of temporary mana that I can then use to channel a strike that I would then get a free point, uh, an additional power strike. So I hit with an attack, I sacrifice my other attack, I get to channel a strike, dealing two power dice worth of damage with it when I do. <clears throat> so I'm always outpacing anyone else that's using strikes, which keeps the, the paladin just that much better at, at using strikes than, than characters. Uh, back of bats. I love that. Uh, improved divine strike. So instead, at 11th level, instead of when you channel a strike power, you get the extra die. You just always get an extra power dice of damage, no matter what. Uh, and then you have the optional class feature. Of course, I prefer this aura of protection. Modified aura of protection starting at 6th level. When you or a friendly creature within 10 feet of you must make a saving throw, the creature gains a bonus to the saving throw equal to the max rank of power gained as a paladin. And you must be conscious to grant the ability. And at 15th level, it comes 30th level. This comes on at 6th level. Uh, your max channel is is uh, at fifth level is two, so it's a plus two bonus at sixth level. That is a lot more reasonable. Um, you could argue that it should be a reaction. That as a reaction, you can target an ally and they gain your they they gain the balance that you provide as long as you're within range. But until the player's handbook in 2024 does it, I'm not going to do that. People, uh, that is I think too much of a variant away from what aura of protection is supposed to be in 2014, but this is a much easier way to curb their, to, to curb how broken that is. And then 18th level becomes 20th level. And then Cleansing Touch, modified Cleansing Touch at 14th level. 
Uh, charisma bonus per long rest. You can spend four mana to use it again. Uh, cleansing touch, like it's like a, it's like a, um, um, restoration. And then uh, oaths of power. So you have that's your subclass. Uh, Paladins gain all the subclass of features with the below modification. So oath capstone feature. Um, you ha you can use your you can use your aura your your divine transformation. You can do it once per long rest or you can spend five mana and you get a, you can use it again. So there you go. Super cool. Uh, I contemplated uh, making it a sustained effect, but it's going to eat your entire character's budget. So I just decided to make it free and you can just gain it again uh, by spending five points. That, I think that was a decent compromise. And it leaves your ability to, to customize your action loop. So that's it for now. I'm going to call it quits for the night. My, night. my voice is pretty much burnt out. So I need to get some sleep. Uh, we're going to come back at lunchtime tomorrow in about, uh, in about, yeah, in about 16 hours, we'll be back at lunchtime and we'll go through the Ranger. And when we get done with the Ranger, then we'll, uh, we'll, um, go through all the conclaves. I should probably be able to get that done in an hour and a half. So I'm going to take a long lunch to be able to kick through all this, see the, the Ranger, gets if, if like the gloom stalker gets five spells so they get their spells plus we give them a list of five powers um the uh the fey wanderer gets five spells so we give them five powers plus their five spells so they get 10 bonus something but like the drake warden normally doesn't get anything so we give them 10 powers just like everyone else super fun <laughs> love it <clears throat> so we'll go through all that and then we'll get into the artificer we'll go through all that and the warlock we'll go through all that and then we'll be done and then we'll be uh, we should be ready for uh we'll be ready for uh our session zero on saturday so i'm just going through all this to make sure everything's up to snuff um if i don't get if i don't get it all done on stream tomorrow at lunch and i probably won't i'll probably have to dive into it for the artificer but uh, but i'll have it all done before game starts on saturday so the document will be will be updated and uh, uh goblin uh, you and all the other playtesters, you'll have access to all this new kit. So, um, man, I, 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 um, I lament not working on Spelljammer tonight because I fucking love Spelljammer. Uh, but this is a priority because our playtesting is coming up. We're going to be back tomorrow morning, continuing to work on the Eberron map. That is our primary project. We always work on that in the mornings. And I work on that a lot of time off screen as well to keep moving the ball forward. Uh, we'll do this at lunchtime. When we come back, I'll do my play test with everyone on Saturday, so I won't be streaming on Saturday for a while. When we come back on Monday in the morning, more Eberron. Lunchtime, we'll probably do a follow-up, like a, like a debriefing of how the Session Zero went, to touch, touch base with everyone. And then um, Monday night, we'll be back on. I'll be back on Spelljammer. So that's it for now. If you think this stuff is cool, thanks. I'm glad you do. And uh, all this stuff you can access uh, my Patreon. Again, you can uh, you can access my pa uh, my Discord community through the About page of my Patreon channel. The play test is on my Patreon. You do not have to be a paying member, but it is a read only document. My play testers will have access to editing, so you can copy paste this stuff, so it's easy for you to be able to pick up and build your character with. Um, there you go. Stuff is fun. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and um, put put us here to check this stuff out. All these books are on DMs Guild. Check them all out. They'll have free previews. Um, that's it. So I'm going to blast out of here, and I'll catch up with everyone tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Laters. <laughs>